Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vals and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 122, we're going to have a short history of the Radio Corporation of America, otherwise known as RCA. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So, last week, or maybe even two weeks ago, we crossed 4,000 subscribers. Wow! When I first started this channel, oh, almost three years ago, I think? I think that's about right. I, I got excited when I hit my first... 100 subscribers. <laughs> Anyways, a big thank you to everybody who's a subscriber, a supporter, who makes great comments um, in the comment section. It's, uh, it's, just been, it's just been a lot of fun. Okay, so this week we got in a whole bunch of RCA clear tops, new in the box, new in the sleeve. And that got me looking at the, at the boxes to see if I could figure out what the plant was. Now, the tubes don't have anything on them. In fact, we're going to actually look at these at the end of the show as part of the new arrivals. So I'm not going to spend any time on them. But So the tubes don't have any code, date codes or identifiers, but the box does. In fact, the little ones do as well. And it's Harrison, New Jersey which was the main RCA plant. And that got me thinking. Why not do a short history of the RCA company? The Radio Corporation of America had its headquarters in New York City, and it was started in 1919 by General Electric, Westinghouse, AT&T, and believe it or not, the United Fruit Company. Now, how, how in the heck does the United Fruit Company get involved with a bunch of technology companies? I don't know. Anyways, in 1932, RCA became an independent company thanks to an antitrust suit that the U.S. government brought against the owner. Now, the interesting bits. The original foundation of RCA was Marconi USA. The company was called this huge, long title, including telegraphy and stuff. But anyways, everybody just says Marconi USA. And Marconi, of course, held numerous telegraphy and radio telephony patents of high value, including, of course, patents on vacuum tubes. And that brings us all the way back to where we started, Harrison, New Jersey which was the first RCA plant, and it was huge. And that was the main plant for tube production. Now, RCA had about a dozen plants at their peak all around the U.S. But if you've got a tube made by RCA, there's a very good likelihood it came out of the Harrison plant. Now, what's interesting is that plant was built in the late 1880s by Thomas Edison and was used to make the world's first commercially available light bulbs. In fact, if you're really young, you may never have seen an incandescent light bulb. Now, I don't have any in antique... Actually, I have some small antique light bulbs, but anyways, I didn't think to bring them out. But this is a big sucker. This is a 200-watt uh, incandescent light bulb. And just in case you didn't know, this is a vacuum. And of course... Up here, that lamps it is a filament. Okay. And, of course, light bulbs can run DC or AC. Anyways. Now, that makes perfect sense that they wanted that plant because they already had equipment for making basically vacuum tubes. Okay. Now you understand everything I know about the early... RCA history and plants. And Charles, who's really into the boxes and that kind of thing of these early tubes, is going to walk us through some samples. 
Okay. All right, so we pulled out a number of different boxes here from our storage to give you a look at them. And at first glance, most of these look pretty similar. And we're gonna start over on the side here and take a look at this first one. And this is a box for the 5691, which is just a premium 6SL7 equivalent tube that RCA produced. And while this looks similar to these other older style boxes, it does have a big difference to it. If we turn it to our side, we've got a bit of a different logo here. Let me see if I can get that right on screen for you. And that is his master's voice. Now RCA, and you'll see RCA Victor down here, bought the Victor company of, of I guess at the time it would have been England or Britain, um, but of the UK. And they bought them and got this logo along with the deal. And they used this for years and years in their, uh, in their record players, in their consoles. This is how they advertised and branded them, his master's voice. And on fa famous record pressings um, that are now known as Shaded Dogs. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, this logo comes from a vintage painting of a dog listening to a phonograph. Intently. So, <laughs> <laughs> intently. So that's one of the older boxes. This is one that's a little bit newer, and this is for a number 80 rectifier. This is just a, a full wave rectifier that was very common and uh, much used by a lot of vintage equipment. And this one just has the same logos on all sides on all sides, and I don't think it says RCA Victor on here anymore, so this probably came a little bit later. Or possibly earlier. It's hard to tell, actually. I'm not sure Yeah, marketing these would have doesn't necessarily work chronologically, so it's, mm -hmm. it's whatever the marketing genius of the day thought he'd stick on the logo. But you can see right here, Harrison, New Jersey. There we go. So there's the tube that was made in Harrison. This one is a little bit more interesting. You can tell right away, the box looks a little bit different from one of these older ones. The logo's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit crisper. We have some different text on it. And if we turn it to the side, we've got an entirely different logo and the name Cunningham on here. Now Cunningham was a West Coast tube producer. Um, I think they were operating in the 30s and 40s. Way back in what I call the first era of, of tubes, which was the radio era. And Cunningham, the, the founder and operator of the company, was a bit of a scoundrel. Um, we probably still have to be careful about what we say about this, but he was producing tubes using patented technologies from RCA without paying them for it. And I believe he was also putting the patent numbers on the boxes as if he was licensing them. I think he make the, made them up. <laughs> Maybe. And he was also copying logos and things, trying to make his branding look like RCA and in the earlier version, even like GE. And because of that, it caused a big lawsuit. RCA obviously was not happy about that, but somehow he managed to come out on top of it and was folded into the RCA company because they wanted his market share because he was actually quite successful. He owned basically the whole of the west coast of the US market. And as a result, he ended up selling rebranded RCA tubes with RCA and Cunningham on the boxes. And he even ended up uh, heading one of their technical research departments as well at one point. So I think he did quite well for himself. So sometimes scoundrels work out, <laughs> or win in the end. So there's a, another really interesting feature about this box that we just noticed earlier. Take a look in here, see if you can read this text right here. What's this about RCA being on the staples? Well, we've got a lot of staples on this box. We've got one on each side, top and bottom, and we shined one of them up a little bit here for you and see if you can see that. Let me hold it steady, and hopefully it's going to be focused. There's RCA marked right on the staple there, and they did this so that people couldn't open up the boxes, swap the tube with a different tube or a used tube, and then close it back up with their own staples. So this is an early form of theft prevention, copy protection. Um, you can tell they were worried about that, probably 
because it was at the same time as working around Cunningham here. <laughs> so that's another interesting box. Well, you know what they say, once bitten, and twice shy. Twice shy. And here we have another similar one. This is a newer version compared to these older guys, and it's keeping a similar logo style to the Cunningham, except we just have RCA on all sides. And this is getting more into the modern era, and this is just a box for one of their standard 6v6 tubes. So that's how it evolved over time. And then of course we have uh, the last version of the box that they made, which was this modern, I believe the, they made these in the 70s and 80s. This is the just flat red with black and white text on it. And it's, it's pretty nice looking, but this is what they used until the end of the second tube era. Yeah, I don't know when RCA shut down tube production, but by about 1982, pretty much everyone was gone. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, thanks for doing that, Charles. You're very welcome. Okay, well, let's clear the decks because we've got a lot of tubes actually came in this week. I'll grab these guys here. Thousands wouldn't be an exaggeration. So we'll just, we're going to take a look at some of the highlights of what came in. You know, if you've watched this channel for any length of time, you know I love rockets. <laughs> so we're going to look at a rocket tube. And... We're going to take a look at this beautiful sleeve. I've got some tubes from the sleeve. And can you unbundle those, Charles? We'll do those last. Okay. Okay, so first up is a Soviet era tube. This is a really quite interesting tube. This is the 6H3N-EB. Now, that's in Cyrillic, so let's translate that. So that's 6N for H, 3, and the and this is actually, I think, the symbol for pi, and that becomes N. <laughs> so six. Oh no, it becomes a P. Oh damn! I screwed <laughs> that all up. I even have a cheater note here that I'm reading. So six N three P. Right. So pi becomes P. Duh. <laughs> and the E stays the same. And the B becomes a V. And we, everybody generalizes and normally just says this is essentially a mil spec tube. But the E means something and the V means something. So E is for extended life and V is for vibration, I think. Yeah, extended life and vibration resistance. Yeah. So basically a heavy duty tube. So it could have been used in military or could have been used in um, industrial applications. And it's got a lovely rocket on here. So, uh, and that of course goes back to the fact that the Soviets had a huge space program and still do. Um, and they were happy to show it off. <laughs> well, they were proud and, you know, Americans were rightly proud as well. In fact, when Canada got involved and built the, designed and made the Canada arm for the space shuttle, the whole country, I think, was beaming with pride. Oh, we even put it on our money too. <laughs> so it's beautifully wrapped in the spec sheet. We're not, I'm not going to open up the spec sheet, but that's always nice to have. And it's a twin trio. That's no surprise. But look at the plant on here. Let me see if I can get it up. This is actually a pretty unusual plant. It's a weird, weird looking logo. And the company is O-K-T-Y-A-B-R. I don't know if that's meant to be pronounced or just spelt out as an acronym. It's probably an acronym. But this was made in the Ukraine. There was a two plant just to the southeast, I think, of uh, Kiev. And they, um, they would have been set up, of course, by the Soviets. And so, they specialized in, in nine-pin signal tubes. Right. And so it's not surprising that there is a saucer getter, that it looks very much like a, a Voskhod rocket tube. In fact, it looks so much like a Voskhod that I would venture to guess that that plant and those engineers actually set this plant up, which was really quite common back then plants didn't just, you know, they didn't grow out of nothing. They had to have... They were being set up by the state. And the, if they had expertise from another plant, they would have sent them over to help them get going. That's right. That's right. I mean, RCA built the very first modern uh, tube plants. Well, they didn't build the plant, but they supplied the equipment and technology in 1939, I think. Yep, for the Soviets. To make sure that they were able to make their own tubes for what was, you know, a war... In their, on, the sh on the near horizon. So, 
You know, a lot of people think that the Second World War just sort of sprung out of nothing, but of course, it it was it was in development for about a decade. So, people who were paying attention, the U.S., Britain, were uh, preparing for it. Were preparing for it, and of course, the Soviets. Okay. Now, we've been finding a lot of 12 AT7s, and this is the latest version. This is the Raytheon Jan 12 AT7 WC. And the WCs seem, they all, doesn't matter who made them, but they all spec really high. So they have high gain, and they're lovely sounding tubes. And I've been dropping these tubes into, um, into my prototype preamp, 12AX7 gain stage, and they've been, I haven't noticed any shift in volume, they've sounded wonderful, so I, I would venture to guess that pretty much any 12AT7 WC will work quite well in a 12AX7 circuit. Now, it's not a guarantee, you have to try each individual tube out, but we've been listening to quite a few lately. And they've all sounded great. Yeah, yeah, surprisingly good. Okay, well... It's not often anymore that we find a lot of inventory new in the box, new in the sleeve. NIS is what I like to notate for that. And, and a tube that I, is a really, it's a high demand tube. We sell a lot of 12 AU7 clear tops. And it's just a great all around 12 AU7. Of course, they're called clear tops because there's no gettering at the top. So where is it? Well, it's tough to see the getter, which is right here. Let me get it close on camera. They kind of have it crimped onto the edge of one of the plates. Yeah, GE did that with the 6S N7. So the gettering, of course, flashes off on the side. So we call that a side getter. Anyways, a lot of these came in. And the beauty of having a lot of tubes is that you can get some really tight matches. And when you have inventory that came from the same factory lot, same made the same days, um, they tend, and of course, new old stock. They tend to ver test very close to each other. So that makes matches really easy. It's good for us. It's good for our customers because, of course, you want balanced sections. And then if you need it, one tube in the left channel, one tube in the right channel. Well, you got to match up four sections. <laughs> yep. Not always an easy thing to do, but finding them new in the sleeve helps. Yes, it does. Now I saved the best to last. We were looking at older tubes and boxes. And here is a number 45. This is a super silver tone. Now the number 45 has become popular. It's a it's an early radio triode, so it's a power tube, and um, there are some modern amps for it. And the reason there are, of course, is that the early triodes in Class A, pure Class A, um, had an amazing sound all to themselves. And there's a number of early triodes. The one you probably know the best is the 300B. And that's one of the higher power. That gets you can get close to eight watts in with a single tube in pure class A. And these were labeled super silver tone. <laughs> Not just silver tone. <laughs> super silver tone. And that was a brand name owned by the Sears Roebuck Company, which later we just knew as the Sears Company. And all of the tubes they sold, as far as I know, always had that silver tone label. Sometimes it said super, sometimes it said silver tone, and most of them were made by RCA. And I'm lucky to have a match pair. And hang on a second. This one even has an interesting label on it. Oh, yeah. So let's see if I can get this label up on camera so you can see. Now, the date is 9-1940, so that there's the, I think that's the month, so it's probably September 1940, and let me flip it over so you can read the guarantee. I wonder if it's still good. <laughs> yeah, so service guarantees were a big part of marketing, especially for resellers like, like Sears, because, um, well, you know, as everybody who's into tubes knows, they're fragile, and some tubes were better made than others. Some lasted a lot longer than others. And the buying public wanted to know that, you know, their tubes were guaranteed. So 
uh, you're often going to see on early tubes uh, labels like that or on the box or even inside you'll see on the tab you'll see a little thing saying uh, return for replacement so mm -hmm. anyways we've got a match pair in the store this has become a really high demand tube and they're tough to find anymore especially we have a lot of them in stock but it's tough to find match pairs okay well if you stay to the very end Here's some discount codes to help you out. Now we've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order's $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us. And we've got some discount codes to help you out. And there's one obvious code that would get you some more money. And there is a secret code if you spend the big bucks and nobody has yet found it, which is great because we that, should start counting the weeks <laughs> until somebody does get it. Yeah, yeah, because that code costs us some money. So anyways, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. From Vals and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.